Thank you very much, <coughs> Dr. Craig. Uh, being an even-handed moderator, I've got two questions for Mr. Ismail to deal with in his second rebuttal. Put aside for the moment, uh, Mr. Ismail, what Jesus has quoted as saying in the Gospels in direct speech, isn't it far more important to discover what the Jews understood him to say? Communication is everything, many would say. Uh, I think we'll go away tonight, won't we, remembering not what Dr. Craig and Mr. Ismail said, but rather what we understood them to be saying. And in the light of that, I invite uh, Dr. Mr. Ismail to comment on two verses, John uh, 5.18. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And secondly, uh, John 10, uh, 33. Again, the, Jesus, uh, the Jews picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I've shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Mr. Ismail. <laughs> Thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wish I had another 16 minutes to respond to those two questions because it could take me at least 10 minutes or maybe even a minute depending how it will go. Interesting to note that our moderator asked Dr. Craig where is the evidence of the Trinity in the, Old, in the New Testament? And I suggested a particular passage, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Did you not recognize that, Dr. Craig? Is that in your particular Bible? Is that passage there? For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. It's in my authorized King James Version, if I open that up here. But it's been thrown out as a fabrication in almost every single modern Bible translation that exists. The King James Version says, yet the King James Version has grave defects. It's, you find 32 scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 different cooperating denominations who said that this particular verse was a fabrication and as a fabrication they removed it. This is a foundation of Christendom, the Trinity. It's not there. The first epistle of John chapter 5 verse 7. Yet many modern day pastors and Christian scholars do not in fact inform their congregation. Why? Regarding the actual issue about Jesus being made the Son of God and being regarded as a begotten Son of God, what do you actually understand? What do you mean when you say God begets a Son? In the Quran, the Quran condemns this notion about God literally begetting a Son. Because begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. And so as a result of that, God cannot literally beget a son. So the Quran condemns that particular connotation. And as I pointed out, Dr. Craig never disputed the point about the fact that the word in Greek is monogenes, not unigetus in Latin. And so as a result of that, most of the major translations have also thrown out that word begotten as a fabrication. Therefore that word, Jesus is the only begotten son of God, or for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, is no longer there. It's been thrown out as an interpolation. It's not in any major Bible translation. Then we've got a problem here. You say that Jesus is the begotten Son of God. Well, I have a, a bit of a dilemma there because if you believe that Jesus is the begotten Son of God, we've got your genealogies. I've got the genealogy of Jesus Christ according to Matthew. I've got another genealogy, the genealogy of Jesus Christ according to Luke. Look at this. Look at this, Dr. Craig. Contradictory accounts that no Bible scholar in the world today can in fact reconcile. <laughs> so if Jesus is the begotten Son of God, then why invent a genealogy for Him? 
Regarding the request by my learned moderator about commenting on John chapter 10 verse 33, it's important to note that every time that there are allegations or accusations about Jesus being referred to as God, what does he do? He goes out of his way to rebut those particular allegations. In respect of John 10.33, the Jews answered and says, For a good work we stone thee not, but for a blasphemy, because thou being a man, makest thyself God. Imagine that. What does Jesus say unto them? Does he say, well, I have a right to make that claim because I am God? He says, no. Is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. He was quoting from the 82nd chapter of the book of Psalm. In other words, if he, God Almighty, called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, then the scripture cannot be broken. In other words, if prophets of God were called gods in the Old Testament, men like you and me were called gods, then why do you take exception when the only claim I'm making is that I'm a son of God? As one particular scholar once said, God has got sons by the tons in the New Testament and the Old Testament. So I don't see a point in respect of that. Okay, please, please, thank you. Just, just let's respect the particular program. The other issue is this. If one has to look, for example, at the quotations of Galatians 3.13, it states clearly and categorically, what does it say? It says, Jesus died as a curse. So in other words, if you are saying, well, look, he, he, he never died as a curse, he wasn't blaspheming, then you are going against your particular scripture. The other point is this, again and again, Jesus is going and emphasizing his humanity. For example, you, I'll paraphrase the issue about the forgiveness of sins. And they question him, how can you forgive sins? Are you God? And what does Jesus say to that? He says, why do thoughts arise in your mind? Why do such thoughts arise in your mind? Which is better, to tell a man who's paralyzed, get up and walk away? Or to tell a man who's paralyzed, your sins are forgiven? Why do thoughts arrive in your mind? What about John 1.1? 1, 1? In the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And so they say, well, look, on this particular basis, Jesus was divine. The Word was divine. The Word was made flesh. But it's interesting that if you go to the Greek, and Dr. Craig knows Greek better than any of us, um, forgive my pronunciation, but in actual fact, it's NRK, Enho Logos, Kaiho Logos, Enpros Tontheon, Kaithios, Enho Logos. And what does it say? If you, for example, were to look at the uh, uh, Journal of Biblical Literature, Volume 92, Philadelphia, such clauses as the one in John 1.1 1, 1, with an anathrist predicate preceding the verb are primarily qualitative in meaning. They indicate that the Logos has some kind of divine nature. So in other words, basically was made God-like, similar to the passage where you'd find in the Old Testament where God tells Moses, I will make thee a God unto Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. The point I want to emphasize at the end is this, is that in respect of the issue of the Trinity, we all have a particular belief. When you say, in the name of the Father, or you basically would say according to catechism that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. There are not three gods, but one God. The Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Spirit is Almighty, but there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. The Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Spirit is a person, but there are not three persons, but they are manifest in one divine Godhead. What are you saying? What are you basically speaking? When you say in the name of the Father, you have a certain mental picture of that loving Father in heaven, millions of times bigger than, I see the pictures out, millions of times bigger than man, but something like a man, the loving Father in heaven. When you say in the name of the Son, you have a certain mental picture of that individual with blonde hair, blue eyes, handsome features. When you say in the name of the Holy Spirit, something that came down to Jesus when John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus on the River Jordan. There are three distinct mental pictures in your mind. And so hard as you may try, you will never be able to superimpose them and say that they are one. But when I ask, how many do you see? You say you see one. That's not actually speaking the truth. That's not actually being faithful to scripture. In Acts 2.22, what do you hear? Yea, men of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, a man approved of God, among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him or through him, as you yourselves also know. Again and again and again, Jesus is emphasizing his humanity. In fact, he goes out of his way to suggest that he's not God. When the Jews make that false allegations against him, he goes to rebut those allegations. 
at every single particular juncture. So without further ado, um, I would like to say that again we see weak arguments being presented which are unsubstantiated and which again go against the scripture. It's interesting to note that Dr. Craig has only given us two quotations and those two quotations are decontextualized. You couldn't show me in more than 45 minutes or more than one hour a single passage where Jesus says that he is God or where he says worship me. Thank you. Well, I was disappointed that in Mr. Ismail's last speech, he decided to desert the issues that have been on the table this evening and instead begin throwing red meat to the Muslim uh, partisans in the audience tonight. And those of you who are Muslims and, and who applauded the points he was making really ought to be very ashamed of yourselves because those are not the issues tonight. We're not here to debate biblical inerrancy, the genealogies of Jesus, or whether or not the King James Version represents the uh, original autographs of the New Testament. Those are silly points. What we are talking about here is the self-understanding of this man, Jesus of Nazareth, that you yourselves recognize to be a great prophet, and therefore whom you must believe as to what he taught, and then whether or not God raised that man from the dead to vindicate those claims. Now, in his last speech, Mr. Ismail made a great deal of certain passages in the New Testament, uh, such as God's only begotten Son and so forth. Let me simply read to you some of the passages in the New Testament that refer to Jesus as ha Theos as God. John 1.18, the only God who is in the bosom of the Father has made him known. John 20.28, 20, my Lord and my God. Uh, Romans 9.5, Christ who is God over all. Titus 2.13, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1.18, of the Son he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 John 5.20, Jesus Christ who is the true God and eternal life. The testimony of the New Testament is that Jesus is divine. He is God. Now what about these Trinitarian passages? The New Testament is replete with multitudes of Trinitarian passages. They're not dependent upon uh, the verse in 1 John that he quoted. For example, uh, consider 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. There the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit are referred to in the same verse. And over and over again the New Testament affirms the a deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and yet their personal distinctness, which is codified in the doctrine of the Trinity. Mr. Ismail dropped all of his objections to the model I presented of the Incarnation, which is logically coherent and understandable. He's never disputed the criteria of authenticity. As for Jesus' radical self-concept, he's reduced to complaining about the number of passages I quoted. The reason I quoted four passages and staked my claim on that is so we could have an in-depth, intelligent discussion of these passages and not just have a barrage of, of texts which would be easy to do but would not be profitable. And he's never been able to refute the point that these passages reveal Jesus of Nazareth, divine human self-understanding as Daniel's son of man coming on the clouds of heaven and as the son of God who is unique uh, and set apart as the only revelation of the Father. The trial and crucifixion of Jesus, attested not only biblically, but in extra-biblical sources, has gone unrefuted. And finally, the evidence for the burial of the empty tomb and the appearances and the origin of the Christian faith were dropped in that last speech. I want to conclude just with a personal word. I myself wasn't raised in a Christian home, but I began to ask the big questions in life when I became a teenager. And the girl who sat in front of me in my German class, who was a radiant Christian, told me about the love of God through Jesus Christ. And I picked up a New Testament, and I began to read the Gospels for the first time in my life. And as I did, I was absolutely captivated by the person, Jesus of Nazareth. There was a ring of truth about this man's teaching that I couldn't deny. And there was an authenticity about his life that was just undeniable. 
Well, to make a long story short, after about six months of the most intense soul searching, I just came to the end of my rope and I gave my life to Christ. And His love and presence flooded into my life. I, I experienced a spiritual rebirth inside. God became a living reality to me, a reality that I've walked with now day by day, year by year, for over 40 years. And that's basically why I'm here in South Africa tonight, because I love to share this good news of Jesus' love for you and the possibility of your knowing God through Jesus Christ. So if you're a Muslim tonight and you've been seeking for God, but God seems distant and unapproachable to you and, and unreal, you, you sense your guilt and your unforgiven sin, I want to encourage you, do what I did. Get a New Testament, begin to read the Gospels, and ask yourself, could it really be true? Could this man be not only a prophet, born of a virgin, one who did miracles, as I already believe, could he be more than that? Could he be the divine Son of God? Come to earth for me to die on the cross for my sin, that I might be reconciled to God the Father. I believe that he was, and I think if you'll look for it with an open mind and an open heart, it can change your life, just as it changed mine. Mr. Ismail has the uh, last word on this part of the debate. His closing statement, five minutes maximum, please. Thank you for that enlightening last experiential that you gave us, uh, Dr. Craig. It's also good I met a Hindu friend of mine some time back that gave me a similar experience that he had. We'd like to ask our Christian friends who Jesus was when he was supposed to be dying on the cross when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Perhaps you will say that's a human part of Jesus. But if you say that, then in that case Jesus was not the perfect sacrifice according to the doctrine of propitiation. As according to the Christian doctrine, all men are born with original sin because of Adam and Eve. So if he was born without the sin, then he would be less than man and therefore he could not relate to temptation and suffering. You see how one shoots oneself against the foot. And up to this point, Dr. Craig has not answered those particular issues. He's totally evaded those two issues. I gave you simple examples. Please, please, thank, thank you, thank you for that. I gave simple examples. The issue of Jesus on the fig tree and the issue of Jesus dying. And Dr. Craig, in his time and his rebuttal, has simply, as if he, I never mentioned those statements at all. It's important to note that the greatest commandment in the Bible and the Quran if we want to understand it as emphasized by Jesus on whom be peace, when a scribe comes to Jesus and asks Jesus what is the most important of all commandments, Jesus repeats word for word what Moses said a thousand years before. Shema Israelu Adonai Ilahainu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He was not one in a trinity. And he used the word Echad which Moses used a thousand years before. 600 years later, when a Christian deputation from Najran come to Medina, they spend three days in the mosque, they sleep in the mosque, and over a period of time, they question the Prophet theologically. And they ask him now, Muhammad, what is your concept of God? And Muhammad is made to reply, Qul huwallahu ahad, say he is God, the one and only. If you were to look at ahad and ikhad, linguistically, they are identical. And so, in the line of the prophetic tradition, the Prophet Muhammad was continuing the same message that was preached from David, Solomon, Moses, Abraham, and Jesus, and bringing it to finality. There was no distinction in any of that. It's later inventions, idiosyncrasies, that change what people want to read. So it's important that if Jesus knew that God is a trinity, why did he not say so? If you take all the words of Jesus, a red letter Bible, and you cut off all the duplications, you won't be able to even spell out the word Trinity. Why did he not say that God is one in three or three in one? Instead, he declared again and again that God is one, full stop. True imitators of Jesus will imitate him also in the declaration of God's oneness. They will add, not add three where Jesus never said it. Does salvation depend on this command? Yes, said the Bible. Jesus made this clear when another man approached Jesus to learn from him. The man fell on his knees and said, Good 
Master, what good thing shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, Why callest thou me good? There is only one good, and that is God alone. And so by so saying, Jesus made a clear distinction between himself and between others. It's interesting to note, and I would say on a positive note to my fellow Christians, that according to Shabir Akhtar in his book, The Final Imperative, a Christian theology of liberation, he says that there are three conditions for being accepted as a Christian. One, belief in the existence of one God. Acceptance of the ethical and religious authority of the historical personage of Jesus Christ. And lastly, a commitment to viewing the life of Jesus as disclosure and human exemplification of the moral excellence of deity, such that the imitation of Jesus' behavior is already a moral action in the behavior's life. If we are to accept that that is the essence of Christianity. In other words, if you want us to accept that, you can qualify as being a Christian without necessarily accepting the divinity of Christ. And what, that's what the Anglican bishops have done. They say it's no longer a condition to being a Christian to simply accepting the divinity of Christ. It's becoming a minority view in the Christian world, brothers. It's not a majority view, it's a minority view. Look at the Anglican bishops, look at the biblical scholars, look at the own Bible, look at your text. Where do I see any kind of evidence about Jesus claiming divinity? Again and again and again, he emphasizes the point of the oneness of God, about the separation between him and God. Again, he rebuts the allegations of the Jews when they make accusations of blasphemy against him. As he said, seeing they see not, and hearing they hear not, will they then not understand? Can't we see the truth? Can't we see what we read in the New Testament and indeed in the Old Testament? Where is the evidence that a man can become God when we hear the expression, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Thank you for that and I hope we can continue the discussion on a stimulating exercise. God bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ismail. I think it's coming down to this question of whether Jesus is alive today. I would distill it in that way, I think, if I were sitting as a judge. That's the basic issue. Now that's where I think you can help us from the floor. If you have any personal experience like that of uh, Dr. Craig's, you may want to tell us. The problem is our time. We have to finish at quarter to ten. You have twenty seconds if you like to comment, and we value that, and then ten seconds to ask a question. There are going to be two microphones. They're already here, one there and one there. One in front of Mr. Ismail, one in front of Dr. Craig. Please choose which debater you would like to question and go to the uh, appropriate microphone. If you want to question Dr. Isma uh, Mr. Ismail, come to this one. Dr. Craig, that one. And then I will alternate in taking questions one to the other. The questioner will have one minute to answer and um, the other lead debater will have a moment or two to respond uh, to the comment made by the one answering the question. Mr. Ismail, my question has to do with your claims concerning mythology. How would you deal with a similar accusation lodged towards Islam? That is, can we not argue under the same conditions that Islam is simply a derivative of the Gnostic Gospels, the infancy Gospels, since they are a late uh, uh, edition? And how do we reconcile that with the claims? Because I, I think that your accusations against Christianity can also be turned against Islam. Thank you, Mr. I think the Gospel of Thomas, and Dr. Craig could correct me on that point, you find passages which refer to Jesus assaulting people, Jesus behaving in manners which basically contradict his entire prophetic behavioral patterns on earth. So what the Quran would do is that it would basically um, 
if, if you find, for example, parallels existing in Gnostic Gospels, then I would, with similar reason, suggest that how do you reconcile the fact that in the existing Old Testament, and indeed in the New Testament, you find, for example, parallels with the epics of Gilgamesh and the Code of Hammurabi, with ancient texts. Um, many particular scholars, modern day scholars, would suggest that um, some of these particular writings cannot entirely be rejected. That's why even the existing Gospels draw some of the information and the material from that. In respect of the issue of um, uh, the quotations given by Dr. Craig pertaining to the passages found in Surah Maryam, I mean, those particular passages are used to convey certain moral points, certain moral systems. For example, his first miracle in the Quran, where he basically defends the false accusations against his mother. The first miracle in the Bible is you'd find him, for example, turning water into wine. So, more often than not, you find that sometimes, even from the Quranic point of view, these passages are there to convey certain moral points and value systems. But I don't have any kind of um, um, criteria. One cannot just simply reject passages um, just from the basis that the Gnostic Gospels, or they come from the Gnostic Gospels. When did the New Testament come? I mean, when was the first uh, dated, earliest dated New Testament? It was in the 8th century. Ten seconds, yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Do you wish to respond? You have one minute if you do. Sure. The, the point that I was making there was that when you compare the Quran to the New Testament as a historical source for the life of Jesus, it's just incomparably poorer. It comes 600 years after the event, written by a man living in Arabia who had no independent source of historical information, and he unwittingly picks up these demonstrably legendary stories from the apocryphal Gospels. And the Quran doesn't so much correct the infancy gospel of Thomas as it simply excerpts from it and repeats these miracle stories about the boy Jesus thinking that these are historical and not knowing that in fact these are legendary forgeries that arose two or three hundred years after Christ that was the point I was making thank you Dr. Craig now a question to Dr. Craig from the lady on my left Dr. Craig, I would like to know if Jesus was a Christian a Jew, when did he become a Christian? If Jesus was a Jew, when did he become a Christian? Is that the question? He never became a Christian. Okay. Jesus was Jewish through and through. All the disciples were Jewish. The early Christianity was Jewish. It wasn't until Antioch, in the city of Antioch, that people called these Messianic Jews uh, Christians. And what does that mean? Well, Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. And so they were called Messianics. Uh, messianic followers of Jesus um, and many Jews today I, I was just in Israel last year call themselves the Jewish equivalent they call themselves messianics so Christianity is from its earliest roots Jewish uh, right through and through but the Jews, of, uh, the rabbinical Jews, that is to say, eventually rejected these messianics and said, you, you can't be part of the synagogue, and they anathematized them and, and kicked them out. But I, I, in a sense, consider myself more Jewish than many modern-day ethnic Jews who are atheists or agnostics and don't believe in God. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Oh, sorry, could I have a reply yeah. to that? Thank you. Yeah, in respect of the issue 30 of, seconds. In respect of the issue of Christians, it's interesting to note that in Acts chapter 11 verse 26, when the disciples are called Christians first in Antioch, that term Christian is used as a label of abuse that these are Christians. It's a label of abuse. Read the context, what happened in Antioch. And the point is that this is a distinction between Islam and Christianity. That whilst Islam and Muslim is not a generic term, it means peace acquired through submission to the will of God. Christianity is not a generic term, it's a label. And so if Jesus was here amongst us, he wouldn't recognize the term Christian, nor would he recognize the term Jesus, because he was not a Greek-speaking Jew, he spoke Aramaic. And so it goes back to the issue that we don't even have the original words of Jesus, nor do we in fact have his original sayings. And that Christian is a label. Thank you, yourself. Now, uh, your question from the gentleman on my right. Yeah, it's, um, it's not really a question, it's more of a, 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 a general statement to all unbelievers or, or people that don't believe in Jesus. Um, Basically, a model for the Trinity, I believe, it can be seen in, in, in nature itself. And for me, the, the simple way for our mind to sort of put the Trinity into, into context is this. 
you've got water vapor, you've got ice, and you've got water. All three. When you see it, Mr. Ismail, when you see water vapor, what do you see? Water. When you see ice, what do you see? Water. When you see water, what do you see? E excellent, water. Uh, excellent. Sir, have you got a question? No, because no, it's, it's, no, it's just a model that I'm sort of proposing to him to Thank let him you. understand the glory of the risen Jesus. Thank you. I think I could I respond to that. I think it's important, brother, that when you make comments, you shouldn't shoot yourself in the foot. If I have three balls of clay, if I have three balls of clay and I press them together into one ball, then they become one. But now it's impossible to retrieve the original three exactly as they were originally. Now, <laughs> if you if you say water, ha hang on, hang on, hang on. By common analogy, if you say that just as water, water, uh, specifically ice, liquid, and steam, they say water is one, but with three states or three forms, so God Almighty is with three states. On the face of it, it might appear to be a compelling argument, but if I have a cup of water which can become steam, it can become liquid or it can become ice, then it's not possible for me to drink the liquid while the ice and steam remain inside the glass. It's not possible, it's not, it's not further possible for the liquid to beseech the ice to save it from being drunk while the ice stayed a safe distance away and was not itself drunk. So in a similar manner, if God, Jesus and the Holy Ghost are all merely three personalities or three states for one being, then it's not possible for one personality of God to die while the other two remain the safe distance away unharmed by death. <laughs> Dr. Craig? I need the mic back on. Okay. Uh, what those of you who just applauded that point need to understand is that Jesus didn't die in his divine nature. He died in his human nature. So that's not a problem. But actually, I don't like the, the model. I don't think it's a good model. I, it seems to me that that's, that teaches modalism, which is the idea that the Father, Son, and Spirit are modes of the same um, substance. But uh, there, it's, not a, it's not a good model for three persons in one being. Um, now, I have been told by a chemist that it can be a good model for the Trinity because there's apparently a, a, a something in physics or chemistry called the triple point where he says that H2O can exist simultaneously as steam, water, and ice. Now, I haven't checked this out, but uh, those of you who are interested might look into the chemistry of the so-called triple point in physics to see if whether that's possible. In that case, I think it would become a good model. But uh, barring that, it seems to me that it, it teaches modalism rather than uh, orthodox Trinitarianism. Thank you, Bill. Now, I, I qu next question for Dr. Craig, the gentleman at the microphone. Okay, thank you. There's already a question for Mr. Craig because we have noticed that most of the questions from uh, Mr. Ishmael went unanswered. That's why we like just to bring something to lack some answers to all of the questions. Lack because he hasn't get uh, the answer about the why Jesus is called him saying son of man because when we go to the Hebrew we see that son of man is being Adam and looking at the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the book of Luke is being a choice to Adam why Jesus has been twice to Adam we have to understand that Adam after the fall he has been cursed so there was a curse that why Jesus has to come to die in order to remove that curse and when Adam seemed, the Bible said that they were twice in fig leaves. What we know that with the leaves, when the sun strikes you, it gets dry. But the Lord decided that, I don't have a question, I have just to bring something to that. And things like, that's what we see that the Lord killed an animal. And by revelation, we see that that animal is a lamb. Because if we go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 27, verse 26. I'm sorry, sir, your time is up. Have you got a question? No, no, no I just want yes. to hide to Thank what you. has been said. Thank you so much. Do you want to respond to that, Dr. Craig, or should we move on? No, right. We'll, we'll move on to the next question uh, to Dr. Craig, this side. Um, from the floor side, this is not a statement and the floor session, this is a question and answer session. So if you're in the row and you do not have a question, and that question needs to be restricted to under 30 seconds, if you do not have a question um, that meets that criteria, I require you to sit again. Thank you so much. Well, yeah. Yes, thank you. Come, come, uh, madam, come, come ahead. So mine is a question. Excellent. To 
this, <laughs> Mr. Craig and Mr. Yusuf, and really to all of us. What tonight is, I was worried about it at the beginning, but it's made me think about, and I want to challenge you to think about the significance of this evening is going to be seen in the way we talk about what happened tonight, tomorrow, the way we talk about it tomorrow and the next day. And what does it show about our understanding of God in the way we will talk about it? And if it sh to me, I was wondering, does it show a God distant and wanting to win and score points and make cheap, um, score cheap points? Or does it show, in the way we respond to this evening, a God who is loving and serving and Thank you. Showing more. Thank and, you. And, got, yeah, can I just, and I, I wanted to, because we brought up so many parables, I wanted to just raise that parable about, which is told of a father who had two sons. Yes, thank you. Well, we know the parable, and Dr. Craig and uh, Mr. Iswell can respond to that if they want to. Dr. Craig. I would just say that I second your concern, and I hope that my closing statement made it evident that I'm not here just to win cheap debating points, but I, I'm here. Uh, to proclaim the good news of the, the gospel and the love of God. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Could I, could I just say one yes, thing? Sir. Yeah, look, um, I, I would agree with that in principle, that it, the, the debate should not be relegated to simply cheap polemics. And what I would appeal to my Christian brethren, as I would suggest that Dr. Craig appeals to the Christian audience, and indeed the Muslim audience, is read the New Testament. Look into the New Testament and see whether Jesus in fact really makes these particular claims. Because the more and more that you read it, the more and more you come to the discovery that he goes on to emphasize that he is human and that there is one God. And if this is the only defining factor between Christianity and Islam, then there is no reason why we as Muslims and Christians can come together on a common platform in the worship of one true God. Um, Yusuf, is that, if that's right, why did he allow people to fall down and worship him? Would you like to comment yeah, on that? Yeah. Is, is that a question by the, by by the my, moderator? Yes. By the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, it's interesting to note, and since the, if you could give me some kind of, of leeway here, you, the, the moderator asks the question, what about people worshipping Jesus? Now, it's interesting to note that when you look at the New Testament and the Greek New Testament, the word in Greek is proskynesin, which is derived from the root word proskyneo. According to Strong's Concordance, so according to many biblical translations and indeed the dictionaries, they would tell you it means to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand. And so what you would basically find when you look at similar passages in the Greek Septuagint, where the word proskynesin appears, then you'd find, for example, passages which are not translated as worship, but where it's alternatively rendered as falling down before you. For example, in 1 Samuel 25, 23 to 24, it speaks about Abigail. She saw David, lighted of her ass, and she fell down before him. Uh, Elisha, she went out and she fell at Elisha's feet. Um, Joseph's brethren went outside and fell before his feet. And in the Greek Septuagint, the word is proskynesin. Now the point is, most modern translators of the New Testament, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, where you find the word worship used, they give the alternative rendering as meaning bowing down before you, falling at your feet. In fact, according to Miriam Webster's College at Dictionary, they say that the word um, could basically mean to respect, to reverence, and to adore. And even amongst Muslims today, you'd find many Muslims going to the mausoleums and bowing down before many saints. And they would tell you they're not worshipping the dead saint. They're basically paying obeisance, howsoever it might be a cultural practice. So similarly, from the biblical point of view, you find these same passages where we are told that the people people worship Jesus, there are alternative renderings to that in other Gospels where it's simply translated as falling down before him. Thank and if you, you apply the yourself, argument... I must stop you. If, I'd thank you. you to go on. I must stop thank you. Dr. Craig, do you want to comment on my question? Sure. Very briefly. Um, Proskuneo means to prostrate, prostrate oneself in adoration. Uh, and the context would be uh, key to understanding how it's used in the sense of worship or just uh, paying homage. 
And one of the passages I quoted is uh, John 20:28, 20, where Thomas falls down before Jesus and says, My Lord and my God. He uses the words Lord and God of Jesus. And Jesus doesn't rebuke Thomas. He says, Thomas, have you believed? Because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without having seen. So I think the moderator's point is correct. It's Jesus' reaction to the way people worship him that indicates that this man didn't think of himself as a mere human being. For To sanction that kind of activity would indeed be idolatrous. Thank so you very I, much. I respond to that, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman? No, I think we, we, we must... We must so the gentleman here, you've got a question coming, uh, Yusuf. My is going towards uh, Mr. Ismail. Um, of all the Quranic text I have here, and I'm willing to, 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 to submit it, I want to limit myself to chapter 4 of the Quran, verse 171, where he says, Jesus Christ is the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and also Messiah. And this, uh, to me, it would be difficult if someone would separate you, Mr. Ismail, your Word, your Spirit, I'm sure we wouldn't want to see how you would look like. Therefore, therefore, I, I know that you don't want to detect that particular Quran, chapter 4, verse 171. Not only that, if God is the only one that can save, and Jesus Christ is the only one that is referred to as Messiah, Masihi, in Arabic, why wouldn't we baptize you if you want? Thank you. Yourself to respond okay. to that. Th thank you for that, brother. In fact, the quotation, Surah 4, verse 171, actually goes against what you're trying to imply to the audience. What does it say here? Look at Surah 4, 171. It says, O people of the book, it's addressing you, sir. It says, O people of the book, commit no excesses in your religion, nor say of God, ought but the truth. Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, was no more than an apostle of God. In other words, it's saying that he was not God. So I can't see how you're using that passage to prove that he was divine. It says Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, hang on, was no more, was no more than an apostle of God and his word which proceeded from God. Now when we speak about Jesus being the word of God, we believe that each and every single human being is the word of God. Why? Because in the Quran there is a proclamation which says, Kun fayakun, be and it is. It is by the will, the power and the word of God that each and every single human being lives here. And so if Jesus was the word of God, then he would be no difference from us. Regarding the aspect about Jesus being the Messiah and why don't we accept him as God, well what do you say about the fact that in the Old Testament, you find in Isaiah chapter 45 verse 1, God tells David, thus said to his anointed Messiah, Cyrus, a pagan, with your right hand shall you subdue nations. And you find pots and pans, David, Solomon, they are all referred to as Messiah. So the fact that Jesus was a Messiah simply means that he was anointed or consecrated to a particular position. But it in no way implies that he was God. In fact, in John's Gospel, in John 10.33, once Jesus refutes the allegations that he was ambiguous in respect to his claims to being the Messiah, then they make the second allegation that he's claiming to be divine. And then he goes on to rebut that particular allegation as well. So the verse you're basically quoting goes against your initial presuppositions. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I, Bill. Uh, no, I think I think we've got to hear Dr. Craig now. Thank you very much. Responding there. Uh, I agree that the Quran does not teach the divinity of Jesus. I just think that it's mistaken in so doing. And that's why I don't, one of the reasons I don't regard the Quran as a revelation from God, because I think it's got it wrong about Jesus. In particular, it's got it wrong about the crucifixion. The Quran says they did not crucify him. They did not kill him. And that is just historically, demonstrably incorrect. So uh, I think that Muhammad, though in some ways uh, a, a great religious leader, in that he promoted monotheism and the oneness of God against the pagan polytheism that was in Arabia at that time, I think he went off the correct path when he denied the deity uh, of Jesus and uh, began to condemn uh, Christians to hell for their uh, blasphemous beliefs that Jesus is in fact the Son of God and is divine. 
So the case that I presented tonight is an attempt to show why I think it's more rational to be a Christian monotheist than a Muslim monotheist. Thank you, Dr. Craig. I'd like to take one more question. I think it's this side, Dr. Craig's side. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, welcome, Dr. Craig. Thank you. Um, I am a little bit quarreled why you didn't tackle the question by Brother Ishmael about the development of the uh, Testaments, the Gospels. Uh, we know, for example, that there was political strife in the uh, Roman Empire at the time. And, 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 and clearly this seems to propound um, the Roman uh, paganism of the time. And, and, and this is all that you're proving here tonight. Um, so with, with the Gospels developing the way that they are, um, it doesn't say anything about uh, worshipping God. It just brings in um, uh, Jesus as... Uh, I Thank think you. you previously I, I, mentioned Mithra. I think we've got the question, Dr. Craig. Yeah. Well, the reason I didn't talk about the synoptic problem or the development of theology within the Gospels is because it wasn't relevant to tonight's question. Tonight's question was identifying Jesus. Is he man, that is to say merely man, or is he both God and man? And my case for the humanity and divinity of Jesus doesn't depend upon any particular view of the development of the synoptic gospels or the theology of the New Testament. What I do is I use the methods of modern biblical historical criticism to drive back to the historical Jesus using these criteria of authenticity and show that the historical Jesus himself made claims which imply his divine human status. So all of these other points are later, subsequent issues that can be addressed later on in another occasion. Well, we're not interested here in biblical inerrancy or the synoptic problem. We're interested in understanding who Jesus was. What did he think of himself? And my claim is that when you look at the historically authentic words of Jesus, you find a person who, as C.S. Lewis said, cannot be dismissed as just another human teacher, as the Quran claims. He was either a nutcase, or he was a blasphemer, or he was who he said he was. And I think that he was who he said he was because of the very persuasive evidence for his resurrection from the dead. As the moderator said, the real question is, is Jesus alive today? If, if he has risen from the dead, then he must have been who he claimed to be. And, and so that's my case. It's, it's resting on these two points. And these other points, though interesting and important, are points for another day. They're not relevant tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. And I, finally, I th from Yusuf. I think, I think the, the question, is, question cannot be dismissed because it's an important issue. The synoptic right. problem is an important issue. As it's a I source. Uh, uh, sorry. It's a source of... of, of of the whole debate, not so. Well, it is a source because I basically pointed out, which Dr. Craig never denied, which scholars throughout the world state, that the Gospels are not historical accounts, but basically they are apologetic words, works to prove certain particular theological motifs. And as I showed you earlier on, that there was a development in Matthew's Gospel, you'd for example find a particular view of Jesus, which was humanly, and as you go from one Gospel to the next to the next, you find an evolved idea, an evolved concept of of Jesus. The other point about the statements and the radical claims made by Jesus, all those claims where you want to prove or assume or adduce the divinity of Christ, you have to read into the text. It's implied. In other words, he says um, to the high priest, are you the Christ, the son of the living God? And he says, yes, I am. So it basically is an implication and you have to read into that particular interpretation. And so in light of that, that's why you find someone like uh, William Ellery Channing, who had to go out of his basic way to suggest suggest and conclude that we do not find in the epistles a trace of the strange phaseology where Jesus says, I speak this as God and I speak that as man. It was not needed in that particular day. It was demanded by the errors of a later age. And if it was demanded by the errors of a later age, then in other words, for the purpose of reconciling certain passages which a just criticism can in a great degree express, then you have to basically invent a hypothesis 
far more difficult and involving a gross absurdity in order to prove that Jesus was God. Why not go back to the Quranic point of view and the New Testament where Jesus proclaims that he's human and he goes out of his way to emphasize his humanity. Thank you Yusuf very much. Well, it seems to me that we need a debate on the inerrancy, the inerrancy or the reliability of the scriptures, but that's another day. It remains for me to thank Jubilee Church very much for hosting this occasion, to thank you all for coming. Uh, please don't leave, because we have one more word from somebody else. I'm so sorry we haven't got the time for any more questions. I want to give the last word to Pastor Lex, uh, who, has, uh, who is here tonight as the host from Jubilee. Lex. Thank you, John. Well, I think it's been a tremendous evening. Don't you think we should give these three a round of applause? <laughs> Wonderful. It's a joy to be in a context where we can be genuinely tolerant of one another, hear one another's beliefs, agree, disagree, shake hands and even hug at the end. Thank you so much for being here. We need to set up for tomorrow morning, so it's been a joy having you with us this evening. If you're not going to church tomorrow, we meet at 9.30 right here in the morning. So God bless you. Thanks for being here. And we're done. We're finished. Thank you.